but uh, on the web, uh, most of the work I've been doing it with the PHP and with Ruby, specifically with Ruby on Rails. And um, performance was always a, an issue. Um, you know, applications are built once, but then if they become more successful, they need to, to grow all the time. And as, as the volume of data in, uh, grows and as the number of users grows, sooner or later there will be scaling issues. So um, at some point in 2015, uh, at the beginning of the year, while I was having uh, some scaling issues at work uh, with some PHP application, I was wondering if maybe there's a uh, there kind of new language that uh, would be able to, to help with performance issues. I was looking for something that felt a lot like, uh, like Ruby or maybe like Python. It was very easy to learn, very easy to use, uh, very nice syntax, very useful, but which provided um, high performance benefits. So this I stumbled into into Julia. It was a very new project back then. Uh, I think it was version 0 0.4 or 0 0.5. There was no web framework, so um, I thought the language had a lot of potential. Uh, to try, to work, and then. That's how I started to um, to work on Genie and to develop the project, which became the first Julia web framework. Uh, the name Genie came from this idea of uh, having a bit of a helper, somebody that would help you become very productive in, in developing web applications. So started to work on it beginning of 2015. I think first commit was towards the end of the year. Um, it was very, very influenced uh, by uh, MVC frameworks like uh, Ruby and like Ruby on Rails. Uh, so initially, it was more like um, Julia on Rails in a way. Um, but in in the next few years, as, uh, as the Julia ecosystem is consolidating, uh, the ways of doing things in Julia have uh, settled. For example, how to load dependencies, how to manage packages, um, how to load code. Um, Genie had also followed up, and then uh, in a couple of years, it has become a pure Julia framework, which does things 100% uh, the Julia way. Um, surprisingly, there was a lot of interest for web development with Julia, so Genie has always been one of the most starred Julia packages. Uh, it was top 10, maybe now top 15, uh, most starred Julia packages on, on GitHub. And it provides uh, a very powerful and complete uh, toolbox building um, web applications, including a powerful router. It's got its own view templates. It has support for environments, session and cookie management, caching, encryption. It's got a lot of code generators that make things really easy. It has support for web sockets and it has a, a growing plugins ecosystem. Uh, it's like it's stable. Maybe, maybe to be in, let yep. me jump in. Just um, short notice for everyone. I, I started the recording, so just that you know, you're of course invited to also um, yeah join with questions. Yeah, oh, but sorry. whoever doesn't want to be on the recording, yeah, that you know, recordings is still running. All right. <clears throat> Uh, okay, it's, it's reasonably well tested, so it's got close to 300 unit tests now. Uh, documentation is, it's well, it's decent to start with. There's, there's always room for improvement. Uh, in terms of approach, it uses conventional, conventional over configuration, which means that, uh, like for example, I don't know, uh, Java frameworks where uh, extensive configuration files are used. Um, with Genie, similar to, to Rails and Django, things are done more by convention. For example, files being placed in a certain location and uh, files being loaded in a certain way. Um, so that um, is basically less code to write. It's been used in production for many years and uh, it had reached 40 contributors and over 1,100 commits. <clears throat> Um, the Genie is more like Genie framework is more of an ecosystem. So uh, it started with Genie framework, which is the the core web framework, um, yeah, which is used to build uh, standard web applications and uh, web APIs. Um, which and the application can be enhanced with additional plugins. For example, Genie authentication, which provides a layer of uh, database backed uh, logging and authentication. Genie Auto Reload, which is a plugin which automatically reloads the code in the browser when, when working with files and when developing. 
uh, GNUI, which is a new project uh, which provides a higher level of, of libraries and UI elements, for example, to render a uh, data frame or to generate drop downs based on arrays, just things to make uh, things faster and more productive. Another element, uh, another pro project in the ecosystem is Searchlight, which is a, a, a library, an ORM library. It's basically a, um, a set of tools for managing um, databases and working with, with data uh, within uh, Gini applications. And uh, the newest project is Steeple, which is a uh, which which is a library for building reactive user interfaces for for Julia applications, also built on top of Gini, and is very similar, for example, to uh, to Dash. So it's mostly for single page applications, which are very interactive. Um, something is updated on the or changed on the page, and I don't know, we render plots or plots or data tables. And um, it's it's focused on building data centric applications and data dashboards. Um, some some resources here, some links. Uh, I'm going to share the link to the to the presentation. So if you want to to look later on the website and the um, and the repo and the documentation. Um, yeah, which brings us to uh, to the topic of today. Uh, what are we going to build? Um, we'll just go over the process of creating a web application, which allows the users to search a database of Netflix titles and uh, yeah, to find something to, to watch. It's going to be a model view controller application, MVC, MVC app, which is going to use Genie and Searchlight to, uh, to connect to the database. It's going to use an SQL, SQLite backend uh, because it's easier to set up. Um, but uh, all the database interactions will be agnostic, so we can use MySQL or Postgres uh, because the ORM just absorbs away all the uh, all the database details. It's going to allow searching for titles and displaying the results. Uh, it, will, it will also expose the, the data in the form of, of an API. And then if we have time, uh, we're going to see how to, how we can create a, a login protected section for uh, for having users. <clears throat> this is what it's going to look. So we can call it watch tonight. Uh, it's got the search form. These are some some results that are being displayed uh, after the search. Um, the same results being displayed as a REST API. <clears throat> and this would be uh, the admin protected uh, area if we get the chance to, to do it. <clears throat> OK. Let me close this. Any questions so far? OK, no, then. Uh, let me share the other screen. OK. Uh, this is the application as well, running on my local host, just to give you a feeling of what we're trying to build. So when we land on the on the page, we get a recommendation, which is a random movie coming from the database. Every time the user refresh, they're going to get a different title. <clears throat> and if they search for something, say comedy, um, they're going to get a list of results as such. And we're also going to expose this endpoint, which will display the same results as um, REST API endpoint. Okay, maybe one question at the front. Yeah. Um, because I think that's really one question which a lot of people have in their minds. Um, yeah. When you build this app in, in the very start, coming from all the other web apps, you mentioned, um, I think it was before the meeting started also, that performance was an issue. Did you experience performance improvements when now switching to Julia? Um, yes, I mean, we all know that Julia introduces a, a different, well, a different computation model, let's say. So with uh, with Ruby on Rails and with, uh, with PHP and with Python, um, they are interpreted, so they're um, in a sense they're scripting languages. So, um, yeah, uh, performance. Uh, the scripts are being executed at runtime, and performance can be an issue with uh, with large applications and uh, experiencing uh, a large amount of traffic. 
while um, yes, Julia, because it's being compiled after the uh, the initial call, after the initial compilation phase, uh, the performance gets uh, it improves very very well. So we have used it forward to build some uh, some internal applications and some some APIs. And indeed, uh, the performance has improved uh, quite a lot in terms of data processing and handling uh, a large number of connections. Um, but I mean, Julia by itself is not necessarily the solution to all problems. If, for example, the bottleneck is uh, is in the database, then uh, Julia won't be able to to help with that. Um, but yes, indeed, uh, we did experience improved performance uh, running Julia compared to, uh, say, PHP or uh, Ruby on Rails backends. Thank you very much. It's awesome. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right. Um, let me share. I, I set up um, a repo for the application. I'm going to paste uh, the link in the chat. Um, I set up the README with uh, the with the, with the walkthrough of, of the application that we'll be building, and um, as well the the repository contains the uh, the, the full completed application. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> yeah, as we were saying, uh, the objective is to build um, uh, an application, a catalog, which allows the users to search uh, a database for uh, for Netflix titles. And uh, it will provide two ways to interact with uh, with the data. One will be a user-facing um, web page with a, with a search uh, search field, and uh, the other one will be a REST API so that other clients can um, uh, can interact with uh, with the data. <clears throat> um, I don't know of uh, how much experience um, the the attendants have with uh, with developing web applications. Um, and if, if the idea of uh, MVC model view controller apps is very clear, but basically what what model view controller means is um, it's a design pattern which is very common for for web applications, especially for more complex ones, where the logic is being split between a model, a view, uh, multiple views, and a controller. The model is is a series of, of classes or entities which are in charge with uh, communicating with the database and uh, Accessing uh, accessing the data, uh, the views are in charge of, of rendering the data in various formats, either as HTML or maybe as JSON, uh, and the controllers are um, entities which, um, let's say, um, stand between models and views and uh, coordinate uh, the data exchanges between the two. Um, model view controllers are have been successfully used um, for creating user interface um, or user facing applications and it's, it's it's a common design patterns for example for Ruby on Rails for Django uh, for ASP.NET and for other um, wild use web frameworks um, all right let's see um, how we can create this application using G um, and first let's uh, let's start the Julia repo. Let me show we have Gene installed. Um, if we don't have it, we need to edit. Uh, we'll use add Genie. Uh, Genie is already registered in the um, in the Julia repository. Um, if you don't have it, you can edit with pkg add Genie. Um, and once we uh, we have it, we need to say that we'll be using Genie. Using Genie. Right. And Genie comes with a series of uh, application generators. So um, we basically don't need to create uh, or scaffold the applications by ourselves. So we can use uh, a series of APIs that are part of, uh, of, of the Genie library to create uh, the application for us. As such, in order to create a new app, we can use the Genie new app underscore MVC um, a command and pass the the name of the application that we want to to build. For example, we're going to say Genie new new app. I just want to from here. Okay. 
and then you will create now a new type of uh, model view controller application. Okay, a bit slow. Okay. And this is creating files on the system? Yes, exactly. This will create um, the application in a new folder. Uh, we'll set up all the files needed by the application, we'll install all the dependencies, uh, and um, by default, we'll start the, uh, the web server with the application. So here we can see how um, Genie uses PKG to set up all the dependencies. It goes through all the steps. It created a project TOML. It installs all the app dependencies. Just a quick question. So it's uh, recommendable to kind of create an empty new folder where you first move to and then um, call this function new app. But not necessarily or... because Gini is creating a, a folder to host the application, so he's not going to overwrite anything uh, that's already in the folder. Ah, uh, great. Perfect. Thanks. No problem. I think the video is using a lot of CPU, so it's a bit slow. Is it okay in terms of uh, size? Is it is it easy to see what's on the screen, or should I zoom in? A little zoom would be okay, but I yeah. can I can see everything, but a bit zoom is preferable. Is it okay? Yeah, looks good. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No problem. I'll make this also be larger. Wow, this is very slow. I'm not sure. Why is it fetching the registry so slowly? Um, anyway, uh, now now that we're at this topic and while waiting for this, um, it's, it's worth mentioning, mentioning that uh, Gini generators offer, offer a few options. So um, uh, building an MVC app is, is one of the alternatives, but by default, just calling Gini new app is going to create uh, a simpler kind of application. Uh, let's call it a script oriented app, um, which is be pretty much the the core for for creating a, a minimal application, and uh, which contains a route file, doesn't include any kind of database support. It does include it doesn't include uh, the templating engine, um, and it's it's used more for for scripting and for creating um, these simpler applications. Um, however, starting with the um, with, with the basic Gini application, um, the generator API allows uh, progressively in extending uh, previously created application by, for example, uh, adding database support, adding MVC support. So we can start simple, we can start exploring with a, with a simple script, and then as the application grows, we can just add more features um, as, yeah, as, as the application grows. Okay. Finally, it managed to, to get all the dependencies. It pre-compilated um, all the packages needed, uh, needed for the application. And because we indicated that we want to use uh, an MVC app, um, that basically means that we want to have uh, database support. <clears throat> So at this point, Gini is asking us what kind of database backend we want to use. Um, and this is provided by Searchlight, uh, which is the ORM, um, and which supports three database backends, SQLite, MySQL, and Postgres. And like we said, we're gonna use SQLite because uh, yeah, we don't have to, to set up any kind of database server. We're just gonna say one. And then Searchlight is going to add SQLite support to the application. It's almost done, now it's starting the, uh, the web server. Uh, 
Uh, yes, it is possible to set up uh, multiple applications. There's a question in the in the chat uh, if it is possible to install multiple instances of Genie on one server. So um, we can create as many applications as we want, um, and then it's it's just an just an issue of running them basically. So application each application is run on a on a port. So one very easy solution is to have multiple applications running on different ports. By default, our application would be started on port 8000, um, but we can run them on uh, on any random port that we want. Um, although in production, um, we usually don't expose uh, ports like 8000. Uh, it would run like a standard web application on port 80. Um, and uh, in general, it would use a web proxy like Nginx or Apache. So we have a web server, Nginx or Apache, running on port 80, and this is going to proxy the request onto the um, Julia Genie web app running in the back end on a certain port, and it's just going to forward the requests. Uh, in the Genie docs, there is a, um, a tutorial about deploying with uh, with an Nginx web proxy. But yeah, basically multiple multiple Genie apps can be started on different ports, and then we can configure Nginx or Apache to, to serve the application just like, say, different PHP hosts or different PHP applications running on one server. <laughs> Okay, so at this point, um, our application has been created and is being automatically started um, and is now being available uh, on localhost at port 8000. Okay, there's another question in the chat. Let's see. Um, how do you compare Genie with HTTP JL? Does the extra MVC features have an overhead on simple apps? Um, yes, in, in the book Julia Program Projects, I use the HTTP JL. Um, exactly, um, Genie does provide um, a richer API in terms of uh, of toolset and features, and it, it makes a lot of things easier. It, it's a higher level web framework, while HTTP is more of a web server with a few utilities, let's say. Um, in fact, Genie uses HTTP JL as the web server, so in a sense, uh, HTTP JL is at the core of, uh, of Genie, and then um, a modular uh, architecture is being used by Genie in order to build extra features on top of HTTP JL. Um, the overall, uh, because Genie uses a modular structure, um, we really only pick and choose the features that we need. So only the, only the modules that uh, we need to develop a certain application, uh, would be loaded, so um, it's not there is no overhead at runtime. Although some of the more advanced feature, um, yeah, might be used all the time. For example, the router. If you want to use some of the uh, advanced routing capabilities, um, yeah, that 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 would be maybe uh, more more com computationally intensive than using HTTP's uh, router. Um, I use HTTP JL in the book because, uh, yeah, the, the book was more focused on, um, yeah, let, let's say mainstream packages at the time, and uh, Genie was still quite young, and uh, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it was a choice in this regard. I, I I didn't want to focus on Genie at that point. Another question is: It try to load existing project by executing include? Sometimes it fails and says um, by executing include. Um, I'm not sure. I would need to check. Um, there are two ways to to load Genie apps. Basically, now that the app has been created, if we look at the file system, we see that we have a bin folder here. Uh, let's see. So, a Genie applications comes with 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 a bin folder which includes scripts to start the application, both for Unix files, for Unix systems, and uh, for Windows. Yeah, over here. Just a little remark for those uh, wondering about the shell. You can activate this with semicolon. Yeah. And pressing semicolon and the Julia wrapper will give you the shell. Yeah. Some of the things don't work so well on uh, on Windows, but uh, I used to to be on the Mac before. 
but yeah, the shell is, is quite okay though, but some things fail like, like that one. Uh, so yeah, as you can see here on the screen, basically the, the Bing folder includes uh, different scripts to, uh, to start the Julia app, and that's either REPL or server. Uh, the REPL loads the application and drops the user on a, on, a, on a Julia REPL to run multiple commands in the context of the application, including to start the server. While the server one um, loads the application and starts the server using the host and, uh, um, and the port that has been configured. Uh, another way is to start a Julia REPL uh, in the context of the application of the project, as we can see, Genie apps are uh, Julia application, Julia projects. They have a manifest and a project file. So we would start a Julia REPL in this folder and we would activate the environment. And then uh, we would call uh, Genie load app. And that takes care of, um, of basically bootstrapping the whole application. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't include bootstrap JL. Um, I would use I would use one of the two approaches either with uh, with one of the files in Bing or um, loading the, the project just like any other Julia um, uh, application and then using Gini Gen uh, load up. Uh, if that still doesn't work, uh, please open an issue on on GitHub and um, yeah, just add some details about how I can reproduce the issue and um, I'll take a look. <laughs> okay. So um, our application is ready. Um, it's it's running now. At let's see this at port one two seven zero zero one and port eight thousand. The first request is going to precompile, so it's going to be a bit slower. And we can see in the console that uh, requests are being logged. Okay, this is the default um, homepage of uh, of a Genie application. It comes bundled with the uh, with the framework, and uh, it, it is meant to be overwritten by uh, by the developer. But it does point to some uh, good directions if uh, if you're lost. So we can either go to the documentation or we can go to to the Gitter channel to to ask questions if something doesn't work as expected. Uh, okay. Um, all right, how does this work? Let me open the code in, in VS Code. Because this is an MVP application, so it has to support um, database access and um, templating language and more complex view layers. Um, the structure of the application is more involved. But as I was saying, the default type of application, which is um, targeted for scripting, is going to have a much simpler file structure with um, a lot less uh, files and folders in here. <clears throat> if we take a look at, at the structure of the application, um, how this works now. So what happens when we go to uh, localhost 8000? Um, it's that the browser makes a request towards the, the host and the port um, uh, where uh, the Genie application listens. And the first thing that it does is that it goes into the routes uh, file, which will try to match a request. So this is basically the root of the application like this which will match this route, the slash, and then it will execute the route handler, which is defined here in, um, inside the route, which in this case, it just serves a static file, welcome HTML. Um, Agent, can you yes. make it a bit bigger again? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. I can see everything, but it's just a bit easier. For sure, sure. Yeah, perfect. I did? Yeah. Yes, thank so you. So this is how static files, which are being placed inside the, the public folder can be served with, uh, with Genie. And this is just the welcome file that we can now see um, in the browser. <laughs> then the routes file is kind of like the brain, the central point, the dispatcher of the application. Um, any kind of uh, endpoints that you want to, de to define in the application, we're just going to end the, add them to the routes JF uh, file. And then we will define handlers, which are uh, Julia function that are supposed to return the content which will be displayed and returned to uh, to the client. <clears throat> you 
In terms of um, filing for the structure, just taking a very quick look. Um, the manifest and project file are used by PKG. So these are Julia um, dependency management um, files. Bootstrap is one of the files which is automatically generated by Genie and normally should not be used by or edited by the users. These files are used by Git. Uh, the app application is specific for MVC web apps. Um, so if you're creating, for example, um, a, a simple application, let's say a, a script centric application, the app folder would not be present. Um, the bin folder includes the scripts for um, starting the application. The configuration folder includes the various files to control um, the various settings of the app. <laughs> Again, the database application is specific to an MVC app and this contains all the logic for uh, for working and uh, interacting with the application, with the database, sorry. The public folder is where um, the files that need to be accessed on the web are being placed. So anything that is being put here can be accessed directly uh, on the internet, is being exposed by the web application, by the web server. Um, the source file, again, is being used and uh, created by the application, should not be added. Um, and the test folder, uh, includes uh, unit tests for the uh, for the applications to be edited by the developer. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, if there aren't any, then let's look at uh, connecting to the database. Um, as we said, the database folder connect, uh, includes all the information and all the settings for uh, for working with the database. And in order to define um, how the application should connect to the DB, we just need to edit the connection YAML file. Um, if, well, if you're not familiar with the YAML file, this is pretty much um, a pretty popular format or standard for defining uh, user editable configuration. It's, it's considered easy enough, so easier than XML or easier than JSON. Um, so it, it should be quite straightforward to, uh, to edit. <clears throat> um, Genie has the, the concept of environments, uh, which means that various settings are being applied depending on how the application is being run. By default, the application is running in development mode, uh, which, um, which, yeah, which means that um, certain settings or certain optimizations are being done uh, in order, for example, to automatically reload and recompile the application by using uh, revised OJL. While um, at, at the uh, other end, when the app is running in production mode, um, the app is being optimized for uh, high performance and uh, any kind of development features are being um, left out. Because the application by default is running in development mode, um, we will tell the database, the application to connect to um, or to use the settings for, for development. Um, I'm just going to take them from here. The first line. The first line tells the Gini application that it should use the same environment as um, as it, as it is now defined, which is dev. This is a global um, global variable um, available in the application. Um, and it does that it should use the adapter as a SQLite. And for the database, um, it should use DB, uh, the, the Netflix underscore catalog SQLite database inside the DB folder. As we can see, this is not created yet, but because it is an SQLite database, the first time we try to connect to it, it will be uh, created by the application. Oh, sorry, I need to close this. Noises. <clears throat> okay. Um, normally, uh, when the application is started, the configuration is loaded auto automatically upon startup. So, um, it the application picks the connection, connects to to the database, and everything just works. Um, but uh, this time, because we just setting up the connection and the app didn't have the possibility to to load it at um, 
at start time, which is going to load the application, the connection data manually. Another question, what other database does you support? Yeah, so um, Searchlight uh, provides three adapters at this point, SQLite, MySQL, and uh, Postgres. And um, the nice part about Searchlight is that it basically provides a unified um, interface to working with all these databases. So um, you can just swap backends. For example, you can use SQLite uh, in development to, to keep it simple, but you can use MySQL in production and the code would just be um, portable from, from one database to another um, because Searchline generates the queries and provides um, a Julia API to, to interact with the database. Okay, so let's tell the, the application to, to include the configuration and uh, connect to the database. We go back to, to the REPL. And now upon asking, like include, upon including the initializer, the, um, the database access file, um, the application connects to the database and um, the database, because it didn't exist, it gets created. In order to, to load the, um, the database configuration into the application, I included one of the initializers file, as you can see here, it's here, config initializers, search light. Um, all the files that are placed inside the initializer folder are being automatically loaded by application at startup. Um, but as I was saying, because the database connection was not configured now when the app was created, we had to load the, the initializer by hand. And then what the initializer does, it loads the configuration YAML file. It checks that the adapter is being set Right, so that the, the adapter, this one is different. It's not nothing like in the case of production or test environments. And if that is the case, it uh, automatically includes Searchlight and the uh, the specific adapter, so the SQLite adapter, and then um, it connects to the database. <clears throat> so now we have a, a connection to the database, um, and we can see that the uh, SQLite uh, DB has been created here. Obviously, it's, uh, it's uh, empty at this point. <clears throat> now that we have a database, we can um, create our first resource. Um, basically, a, a resource uh, in an MVC app is a, is a business entity, is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a piece of data that we exposed on the internet uh, and which can be accessed at a certain URL. So we can imagine an, an entity, a resource as being a product or a user or a book, um, or in this, in our case, is going to be a movie. In a GDMVC app, um, a resource also is represented by a bundle, which puts together various files to, um, to manage this resource. And these files can be um, models, views, controllers, as well as validator files, uh, test files, and um, migration files, for example, to modify the structure of the database. <laughs> In order to create a new resource, we need to run Gini new resource and paste the, the name of the resource that we want to create. So, for example, if you want to create the movie resource, which is what our application will expose on the internet, we're just going to say Gini new resource movie. The new resource generator. Oops. Let's see what happened. Okay, I don't know. Some some errors, but they are from some different packages. I don't know from pulled arrays. Um, For me, it just works. Yeah, it works. Um, they come from some dependencies of I don't know which package from struct types. I don't know what uses that. Anyway, here at the bottom we can see that um, a series of files have been created. And these files uh, we're going to use in the next step in order to um, access and expose the, the movie data. So it, create, it created a movies controller file. It created um, a model. Um, it also created a database migration. We're going to get to that soon. It created a validator. And it also created a unit test. <clears throat>
we can see that the files have been placed here in the app, in the resources folder. It created another folder called movies, and here we created all the, all the files. Okay, here there's a bit of an issue. I need to look into it. It should have uppercase else in order to stick with Julia's naming conventions. So I just edit it by hand, um, but normally it should have worked. Okay, so we got a movie model. Um, we got a controller, which is just empty. It's a placeholder. Movies validator, which uh, we're not going to use, and which also should have been named. I pushed some some changes before earlier today, and apparently something got broken. For me, everything is capitalized. Is it? Yeah, actually, yeah. I wonder why it didn't work for me. Maybe because of the wording about something like that, I don't know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so all these resources have been created for us, and now uh, we have all the all the placeholders, we have all the files that are needed in order to um, to work with, uh, with movie entities. However, <clears throat> our database is empty, so we need to create a, a table that will hold our um, movie, our movie data. And uh, in order to do this, we're going to use database uh, migrations. Migrations being script, which scripts which are used to modify the, the schema of a database. Um, the idea with migrations is, uh, if you haven't used them, uh, that when you work in a team, for example, or when you need to uh, make changes to the database that can be reproduced in a different environment, um, we need to be able to apply these changes consistently. So that's why instead of everybody going into the database and making changes and basically losing track of, of how these changes are being applied and how the database is being modified, we just create these migration scripts, uh, which will be placed under version control, which will be shared with all the team. Um, and also, of course, we can run them when we deploy the application in production. So if, if, the, app, if, if the database is built by applying various uh, migration files, then, for example, when we deploy the app, um, our deployment script will run all the migrations in order and then we'll apply all the changes to uh, the database schema. Um, Searchlight comes with a system for managing migrations. Um, basically, it needs to help us understand which, which migrations are being run, which migrations need to be run against the database, and it needs to know the order in which this migration needs to be run to apply the changes in a, in a meaningful way. <clears throat> um, so the previous command should have created a migration file for us. Let's see if we have it. Database. It should be in the database migrations folder. And as we can see, it put it here. Uh, because we told we told Genie and to create a new movie resource, uh, then uh, as, as this is being an MVC app, um, Genie considered that okay, we need some sort of uh, database table to hold our um, our data, um, and um, it created uh, the, the database uh, migration script for us. This is just a, a placeholder, but it. it it shows you the DSL that is being used in order to apply database uh, changes, um, and it's quite easy to read. And the advantage of this is also that we don't need to write um, uh, Swiss SQL by hand, um, so it's not going to be database specific. This kind of migration can be run against all the database backends that, which are being supported by uh, by Gini and by Searchlight. <clears throat> um, the idea of migration is that it has two actions. It has an up action and a down action. The up action is going to apply the changes to the database schema, in this case create the table, and the down phase is the reverse of, uh, of the operation of, of the modification of the schema. So basically it informs how to undo the changes that have been applied by the migration in case we want to cancel the changes that we've done, we've done to the database. I'm going to take the code, I'm just going to put it here. <clears throat> And um, we're preparing a table which is going to have, which is going to be called movies. It's got a primary key, and it has a series of columns, um, type which is of type, which is, yeah, type is of type string, then chars, 
title, um, which has a, is a string of length 100. Then we have a list of directors, actors, the country where the music movie was produced, uh, the year when it was made, the rating, the categories, and the description. Actually, I realized that I haven't showed you the, um, the um, data file that we'll be using. So it looks like this. It's, uh, it's a public data set that I downloaded from the internet and uh, it's this CSV file. The type can be TV show or movie. The title is a string. Here can have a director. It has the cast, which is a comma separated list of actors. The country where it's been made. Um, the data on has been added to Netflix, the release year, the rating, the duration, the categories where it's being listed in, and the description and the description of the movie. So in here with the migration, we're creating a table which is going to have columns for um, from for some of the data in uh, in the CSV file. <laughs> we're also using the migrations API, the migrations API to add a series of indexes. So we're creating an index on the title, on the actors and the categories in the description, as this will be uh, columns that will be used for the search. We don't need to create an index for the primary key, as this is being uh, already created by the um, primary key function. The down um, function of the migration just drops the table, so basically uh, it will undo all the modifications um, done by the up function. Uh, any questions here in regards to the migrations? Okay. Um, as I was saying, um, in order for the application to know which migrations are being run uh, and the order in which to run them, um, Genie and Searchlight also need to, to keep track of what migrations have actually been executed so far. And in order to do this, it uses um, a table uh, which is also stored in, in the same database, and we need to ask Jimmy to create it. We have a generator for that, so we're just gonna, uh, gonna tell it to create the, um, the migrations table. Okay, the migrations table has been created, so now we can already interact with the, uh, with the migrations API. For example, we can ask if there are any, mi any migrations that it knows of and what's the status of these migrations. As you can see, the Migrations API told us that there is a Create Table Movies migration, which is down, so it means it hasn't been run yet. If we now run the migration by calling last up, it's going to run the code in this module and it's going to create the Movies table for us. Okay, so now the table has been created. If we try to look again at the status, we're going to see the migration now has been up, so um, the code has been run. The next step now that we have the database and that we have the table is to create a, a model, uh, which is a, a Julia type within a dedicated uh, module, which knows how to interact and knows how to work with um, movie instances from, uh, from the database. The file itself has already been created by the new resource um, function. So we'll have it here in the movies file, and we'll just set it up as follows. Um, following Julia conventions, uh, it's a standard module. Um, it, uh, it uses Searchlight and uh, it exports uh, struct, which maps the um, columns in the um, table that we have just created. Basically, the idea of the ORM is that it maps an object to a row in a database table. So a class is going to, or a struct is going to correspond to a table, and then an instance of that struct is going to correspond to a row in the table. So any object uh, that we're creating here is going to have a correspondent in, uh, in the database table that it maps to. So in this case, we have this struct movie, and we can easily recognize all the all the fields which map to the uh, to the columns which we have just created, right, which are here. Okay. Now that we have code uh, for our model, we can already interact with the database. So, for example, if we go back to the REPL, 
we can load the model and we can create a movie object. We have set up the title and the actors and um, due to the settings that we put here, we gave it the default type to be a movie. So we can see all the properties here. The um, Searchlight API allows us to also uh, work with the data. So for example, we can check if our object has been already persisted in the database. So it, if it has been saved, it was not. Um, <clears throat> so we can call, for example, the save function to persist it in the database. We can see here in development mode that um, in the repo, also the queries which are being executed are being shown. So we can see that here um, an insert operation has been run. Uh, and then um, the last insert ID has been, um, has been retrieved. Also, the API allows for interacting and getting other data. For example, we can now count the instances of, uh, of movie elements in the database. Of course, it's only one, the one that we just created. We can see how um, Searchlight creates the, um, the SQL code for us, or we can get all of them, which is also, of course, there are some warnings which also come from the SQLite package. But yeah, the all retrieves all the um, all the instances, all the all the movie objects from uh, from the database. <clears throat> okay, the next point now that we have the model and that we have the the database table would be to just move all the data from the CSV file into um, into the database so that the users would be able to um, to query the the Netflix movies catalog. Uh, the easiest way to do this um, and so that it can be replicated is to create um, a seeding file. So we have a it question. Has this one. Sorry? That's one question. Yeah. So if uh, is abstract model interface a requirement for plugging in searchlight? Uh, can arbitrary strike? Uh, yes, it is a requirement. Uh, basically, all the searchlight API works with the um, instances of abstract model so um yes it has to it has to be a, um, a, a subtype of uh, abstract model okay you're welcome um as such let's create a small script which will help us transfer all the all the data from the csv file into the into the database so that then we're able to uh, to work with it uh, i'm just going to create a file there's no uh, generator for this uh, inside the db seeds folder, which already exists in the applications, I'm going to create a seedsmovies.jl file. Uh, let's see, I created it here. It's an empty file. Um, and we'll just turn it into a small script, which will create all the data and insert it in the, in the database. So as you can as we can see, the seeding script will run in the context of the um, of the application. Um, as such, it has access to the environment of the application. For example, the, uh, it can see the movies uh, module. Um, here, I have set up a few conversion uh, utility functions just to handle some of the missing data that exists in the in the CSV file. And um, we're also going to be using um, the CSV package in order to uh, go over the data from this um, from this from this CSV file. We're going to need to add this to to our dependencies because the application doesn't have it. So let's add it in CSV. And meanwhile, I will download the file the CSV file and I will put it in the applications folder. Put it in the apps folder. Okay. 
This is the file together with Excuse me, Adrian. Can you yep. just um um may have missed it, but um do you can can you draw, uh, share the link to the CSV file? Yes, of course. Sorry about that. Here it is. You're welcome. All right. Let's see, going back to the editor. Um, froze. All right, so we can see now that um, I pasted uh, the CSV file into into the applications folder in the seed folder. Um, it's the same one that we saw on the Dropbox, all the columns. And now what the what the seed movies um, script does is basically it goes over each row in the CSV file, it just loads it from from the application folder. I put a limit to 1,000 because it's almost 8,000, so it would take too long. And then for each row, it creates a new instance of a movie object. It sets the type, title, directors, and all the other properties um, based on the um, data that it gets from the CSV uh, for each from the row of the CSV, and then it saves it to uh, to the database. If, if we have the dependency, yeah, we have the dependency added. Okay. So we have a CSV now, and now we need to include um, the seed script so we can run the seeding. Okay, it's been included, um, and now we can access the seed function. And now when we run it, I'm just going to import the first 1,000 rows of the CSV file, which might take a bit. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see what happens. All right. So it now basically runs over each of the rows, sets up the objects, and persists them to uh, to the database. Uh, in the REPL, we can see in development mode um, all the queries which are being run against the database for each of the objects. Almost there. Yes, and Adrian, and yeah. if, if you if you have to uh, bring more data into the database, there are ways to to do it a little bit faster. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to to sh to show a bit how um, how the models can be constructed and how can they yes, be set. Yes, of, and, of uh, course. But I would, of course, you wouldn't do it one by one, right? So, for example, yes. uh, CSV as a way of doing it, uh, the CSV package can actually create um, uh, a table, a SQLite table, straight from a CSV file. Yes. Uh, or, of course, you can at least uh, run, I don't know, inserts in, in batch. Now, it's basically, it, it was more of yes. a yes. play uh, test case just to show how things work and how they are yes. being done. Yeah, if you have a lot of data, obviously you don't want to do it like that. If there is a, not a lot of data, it's probably acceptable since this is being done only once. So it depends on if, if you favor readability and portability versus, uh, I don't know, performance or... Uh, yeah, mm. uh, yeah. That, that, that was the reason because the first time I tried to import everything and 8,000 uh, rows just took forever. <laughs> So um, yes, I, I tried yeah. this on on Oracle with the with the Searchlight Oracle client. Yeah, and uh, there are um, some mechanisms to to bulk insert uh, some things, and it's much faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But absolutely. It's it's only a hint for for somebody 
who uh, have uh, the um, task to import uh, thousands of rows, uh, then there are possibilities to uh, do this um, in a much more faster way and yeah. not uh, row by row. Yes, agreed. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this could be extended and I think it would be nice, um, uh, well, later or if, if anybody has time, um, basically all the API is being exposed. So uh, the query builder um, API is accessible. So somebody can look into the um, query which is being generated by Searchlight and um, additional batch uh, functions or methods could be could be added, for example, to take 1000 rows create uh, one batch insert and uh, pass it over into a transaction or something like that. So further imp uh, improvements can be done. This is just, uh, this is more to illustrate um, how to use scripts, how to use uh, models, how to use searchlight, how to run, uh, how to create objects and how to persist them. Um, it, it's not performant, yeah. All right. Again, that's one question. Yeah. Oh yeah, is it possible to use multiple databases in the same project? Uh, let me think. I haven't tried it. Um, Adrian, not not today. Yeah, it's not possible today. It's not possible. No, I was thinking if it's possible to like swap the connection, uh, like to to call connect. And no, the, if we if we want to provide. Um, um, multiple databases we we should go through uh, the source code um, because in in many parts of, of searchlight there's only uh, the hint to to the uh, to one database we yeah. do not um, show to to a certain uh, connection uh, and uh, in some places uh, there's only the the search for for the last entry in the in the database array so um, that's not possible today if there is an um, um, a need for that uh, it's, it should be done it's not so many work but uh, not today it's not possible yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm not aware of. Uh, I mean, there's no support for it. I was just trying to think if it's uh, if it's possible to achieve it in with whatever you have. But if uh, if you tried it and it doesn't work, then then that uh, that would require um, additional extension. You're welcome. Um, Okay, so now finally we have the we have the data in the database, and we can uh, we're about done with the with the model part of the application. Um, so now we can uh, we can focus on building the other parts. Uh, we can basically um, set up the web page to display uh, to display the results. Um, we we touched in the beginning. We said that the uh, routes folder is kind of the the dispatcher of the application. So all the requests that go into the browser are going to be resolved by a route here, where this part is being matched. Is it, it matches a pattern of, of the URL being requested, and then uh, we have a handler function which can be defined here or can be put uh, as a reference. Uh, which will handle the request and will send back uh, um, a response to to the user. Um, <clears throat> so our first step then is to define the new route, which will which will serve the um, the movies uh, catalog. So we'll just call it, or we'll serve it at slash movies, and uh, we'll say that the handler, so that the request is going to be resolved by the movies controller, and namely the index function of this uh, of this module. Since we're referencing it, we also need to edit here. And the controller has already been created by us when we um, asked Jimmy to build uh, the resource. So we can now just put the code in it. We're going to need the index function. For now, we're just going to put it as a placeholder to see that everything works and just to give it a try. It should work. 
So for example, if we now go to movies, let's see what happens. Yeah, it works. So basically we added our new route uh, and we added a handle function and um, the application picked it up and um, sent back uh, the string as the response. Uh, this is all done with with revise. So this is you know revise is pretty amazing uh, piece of code. Um, back in the beginning, it used to be very very difficult to uh, perform code reloads. And noticed how nice it is that every change that we make, files that we add, routes that we defined, uh, methods that we uh, put in in our modules are just automatically being picked. Uh, revise is being really really good at that. Um, otherwise, it would have required multiple um, restarts of the application, basically, and reloading every time we made any considerable changes. Um, but now this happens in development, so uh, Revise is an integral part of Genie, and uh, because it uses this convention over configuration approach, uh, Genie knows where to expect various things to happen, so it knows that the routes need to go in a certain file, it knows that models and controllers go somewhere, uh, so then it's being able to efficiently revise and detect code changes in all these files so that um, the code that we write in development is being readily available. Um, in production, however, because revise can be quite uh, quite expensive when monitoring uh, the files on the file system, uh, this is disabled by default. So uh, the idea is that once the application is deployed, there aren't going to be any changes to it. So um, revised is disabled in, uh, in production for, for performance benefits. Um, okay, now um, that we've seen that we work, let's just add, uh, let's make this function a bit more uh, useful. So we'll ask, we'll ask you to do some, some work for us. Um, and uh, from Genie, we're going to use uh, the HTML rendering uh, module, which knows how to take uh, data and um, return it back to the client as, uh, as an HTML payload. We'll be using Searchlight, uh, and we'll be using the, the movies um, module, which contains our uh, model. And then what we do here in the index function is that we call the HTML um, function from the rendering module, uh, which will output HTML. And we tell that it wants, we want it to render um, the view file from the movies resource. So this movies is the folder, the name of the resource. And we want it to render an index view file, which we haven't created yet. And we want it to pass into the view an instance of an object uh, on array called movies uh, which will pick uh, some random uh, movies from the database when the user lands on the page. <clears throat> As such, we need to create the view file that is going to be used in order to render our HTML page. We, we see that we put it here. And this is um, Genie's uh, templating language. Let me put it here just to see how it looks. Um, this is, in a sense, um, HTML which embeds Julia code. So we can, it's it's a form of, of templating language which is very HTML-like, so it supports all the HTML API. Um, it can be pure HTML if we want to, uh, but we can also include um, Julia code which is being uh, parsed and compiled, um, allowing us to create uh, dynamic functionality in uh, in the view. So basically now what we do in the view is that we display the heading, the title of the page, which is called Watch Tonight. And then, as we said, uh, we're passing um, this, um, this, the rent function will return an array of uh, movies, uh, of random elements. Um, and we check and we say if, uh, if not is empty, then iterate over each item in the movies collection and render them using another view, which is called a partial. Uh, which will know how to uh, represent a movie entity as, a, as HTML. While if, it's, uh, if, if there is no uh, movie in the collection, just show some default uh, error message that there are no results. 
and we decided to also put these into a view partial. What is the difference between a view and the view partial? Uh, a view is used to display um, a large uh, part of a page, so multiple elements, a lot of HTML code, um, pretty much all of the page, while a partial is being used um, to display a small piece of data. So, you know, especially something that gets repeated multiple times. So, for example, if we want to display a list of 100 movies, then we will want this small uh, piece of HTML template, uh, which is in charge of rendering a movie element, to be repeated 100 times. So then we, we're going to use a view partial, which is being loaded in the view itself, and then it's just being uh, used 100 times to display um, all the elements. So it's like a more dedicated piece of view, which is specialized to render just a certain piece of, um, of data. <clears throat> We're going to need to also create these uh, these view files, the partials. So I put it here. Um, the question: Is there any embedded tool in Genie to periodically update some components on the page, or is it better to use JS? Um, this is going to this is part of a different project um, which is called Steeple, uh, and Steeple is um, a library uh, built on top of Genie, which is dedicated to use it to creating reactive UIs uh, for web applications uh, for Julia web applications. So that's very reactive. It uses um, um, a different uh, architecture. It uses a model which is being exposed into the view. And then the data is being synchronized automatically. So when you change, for example, something in Julia, one of the properties of this uh, view model, it's uh, the data is automatically synchronized on the front when it's being picked up and uh, the UI is being updated. And the same goes in reverse. So if you update something, uh, any value on the front, then uh, that value is going to be automatically updated in the Julia code. So that uses uh, Julia and uses WebSockets or Ajax polling and view and a lot of, and, and yeah, it, it provides rich functionality with a lot of view, um, view libraries like the Plotly view and uh, view UIs and so on. Um, can be steeple used with Gini multiple, uh, multi-page project? Uh, yes, yes, it can be. Um, the tendency or uh, more of the, well, let's say architecture approach is to use, like steeple is more, designed to develop single page applications uh, as is built, for example, with Node, where uh, you have an API in the back end and the front end just stays on one page because there's usually no need to navigate across pages. The UI just updates dynamically. So think more interactive data dashboards, uh, but there is absolutely no issue in uh, having one uh, steeple page, which is within uh, a multi-page Genie application. Uh, the only thing to consider is that um, a steeple application might have considerable JavaScript, so it's going to load view, it's going to load whatever charting libraries or it depends on, on the use case. So um, yeah, if, if you're gonna navigate through multiple of such of these pages, uh, if the JavaScript, for example, cannot be properly cached or if it's not being used on, on all the pages, then these pages might take a bit longer to, to load. Or, But yeah, normally there's absolutely no issue um, to do it like that. Mm. Okay, uh, notice that the uh, movie uh, file starts with an underscore. There's no requirement to do that. Um, it just it's, it's a naming convention to indicate that it's a it's a partial file. Um, what what matters is um, what what we pass here. So here we pass uh, sorry um, here. So uh, we just passed uh, the actual name of the file. <clears throat> Let's put the code in. You're welcome. Um, in, in the HTML code, so as we said, this partial is it's dedicated to just displaying one movie entity, one one row of, of movie data. 
Um, and the site receives the real HTML, which is being uh, combined with uh, with JavaScript code, uh, with with Julia code. Sorry. Um, let's see what we have. It notice here then how we pass this instance variable into the view. So we pass an array of random movie elements. By default, this will only return one uh, element. And here in the view, where we load the partial, again, we pass we pass the same um, movie object, the one that is used here and, it, and that is available inside the, uh, the iteration. So the movie um, value is being then received inside the partial and it's accessible here. So then this is the this is one of our models. It's it's an instance of a model. So then we're able to access these properties. So we have movie title, year, type, rating, description, and so on, all the other properties being rendered inside the HTML code. <clears throat> we have a question. Yes, please. Um, if you can go through the index. Yes. There is this for each. Can we also write the for each with a for loop, or is this um, kind of a still convention to return an array, or does it do more stuff? Yeah, what happens is that um, the templating language is um, string based in the sense, or I don't know, string centric, let's say. Pretty much every, everything that happens here um, should return. Uh, a stream, something that generates an output, which is being, then being used and rendered into the browser. So um, the really nice part about the view template and the, about the templating language in Genie is that it is not a simple stream parsing. Um, I tried it in the beginning a few years ago, uh, coming from, from Rails, for example, where everything is being evolved and uh, um, just um, parsed at runtime and evolving things into Julia in order to be able to, um, to parse the dynamic um, pieces of Julia code was terrible in terms of, of, of performance. Basically on each request, uh, this big template had to be um, evolved as a string and that was really, really bad. So now what happens is that um, Genie's templates are compiled. So this uh, HTML looking code is actually being, um, upon the first request, is being converted into a pure, uh, into pure Julia code, which would generate the corresponding uh, HTML output. What I'm trying to say is that, for example, this H1 um, would be created um, or turned into the HTML, into the Julia counterpart of this function, right? Like an, HT, an H1 um, Julia function. Or if we're here, this div would, would be created into a div function, which inside would contain an h3 function, which would, um, does it make sense? Um, so, yes. So all the HTML code is being converted into pure Julia code, which can be compiled and pre-compiled, and it's, it has very high performance. Um, as such, all of these Julia functions need to output something. So um, otherwise, if, if the execution of the function doesn't have any kind of uh, output, uh, nothing results from the computation. And the issue with uh, for loops is that they do not output anything. That's um, that was yeah the big uh, the big issue. Um, Either you can do a four, but then you need to collect the result of each um, iteration into some sort of string that would be uh, that would be returned at the end. I don't know. Does it does it make sense? Yes, thanks a lot. But for each is doing exactly this. Yeah. So basically, it needs to be collected. I don't know if we can see it, but um, yeah, this macro is provided by Gini Renderer HTML and. Uh, it, it knows how to load the view, it go over it for each iteration, collect all the output, and then return it at the end. Because otherwise, um, yeah, it would be either the test of the user or basically the for loop would not produce uh, what would be expected. I think it would basically return just the last iteration, if, if I'm correct. Um, 
So this is the reason why um, why the forage macro is being used. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. A question, uh, Rand is picking one movie, but how many movies querying uh, from for each call? Or is it just sending one random ID of movie database to pick one movie? Uh, the Rand function is using uh, whatever random engine uh, the database provides. So it's not going to pick uh, all the data. It actually builds a query uh, which um, picks one item or what? how many we tell it to pick by random. Uh, we can just take it and run it to see what it generates. Um, so if we say run movie, we just ignore the warnings. They're from SQLite. I don't know why. But to, to, you can see the query that is being generated. So it does a select from movies and it does order by random, ascending, and it does limit one. And we can also pass it, I think, limit. And yeah, which is going to return a collect or connect or co collection of ten movies. Okay. Let's see if we can see better. And it's basically the same query, um, ordering by random with a limit of ten. And well, the performance is pretty good also. Okay, let's see where were we? Okay, so we we did the uh, movie view, movie partial, and now we can do the no results one. Okay. We're just creating the file, the empty file, which is going to be used when. Well, now we see the database, but uh, there's going to be the situation, for example, if the query for searching uh, doesn't match any results, then we're going to have to save that to the users. And here uh, it's, it's very simple. We just put an H4 and we say, sorry, there were no results found. Um, here is another type of embedding Julia code into the, um, into the templates. So we can either use these this kind of um, of code where we can put multi-line uh, content Julia Julia code or we can use um, this uh, string embedding uh, when we use uh, Julia's dollar notation uh, just to put small pieces of code within uh, HTML strings and in this case the params is a global collection which contains um, the parameters of the request. So the expectation is that we're going to have a form which is going to make a get request uh, with a variable called search movies, and which is going to retrieve this um, this input, this search, this param, and then we're just going to display and is going to show what uh, what the user said, had searched for. We're just going to see it in action in a, in a minute. Mm. Uh, I think we can see it already. Let's see what happens. Okay, yeah. So this is our index, um, our index page, our index view, uh, which displays the title. And every time we reload it, it's just going to show a random selection for, for the user. We can see how the data changes and how it's being displayed. <clears throat> However, it looks um, quite uh, ugly, so we can make it a bit nicer. And it's also a good opportunity to, to introduce the idea of layouts. Uh, as we have seen, we have the views have multiple hierarchies or multiple layers of um, hierarchical layers. Where are we here? Um, so this part is being rendered by the partial, by the view partial, by the movie um, uh, partial. The whole part here is being uh, rendered by the view file, where we have the heading and the view partial being uh, rendered in this piece. And they also have a higher level um, view structure, which is the layout, which is responsible for anything that is around the view. Okay, maybe we can also do this larger. 
And um, by default, um, a Gini MVC app comes with, with the layout here, giving the app, uh, app layout. Um, it's a very simple uh, basic file. It's got a title uh, and it has this uh, code block with the yield macro. Um, and where, where this one shows the content of, of executing the controller is being placed. So pretty much the output of, of this is being rendered here. <clears throat> and because the, uh, the layout is, is the part that, that is visible around the view itself, here we can apply um, or we can add HTML, which is going to be uh, visible across all the pages which use this, uh, this layout. And we can include uh, a CSS file, for example, for Twitter Bootstrap, just to make the page look nicer. I'm just gonna load it from oops. We're just gonna load it from the CDN. All right. Some of the file apps are being created read only, so they need to be uh, overwritten or made or made writable. And now if you reload it, we should see. Yeah. All right. So now that we applied the um, the Twitter Bootstrap um, theme, basically that we loaded it in the page. We can see that the styles have been um, applied, and um, yeah, the page is much prettier. Mm. Okay. Mm. All right. We can now move to uh, add the search feature. Mm. Um, the idea being that uh, when this page is loaded, we're still going to show this random title, but here in the middle, we want to put a, a text, um, a text input, a search input where the user can type a search term and uh, we will only return uh, matching results. So um, we're just going to add the search form into our uh, index view. We said we're going to put it under the title and above the list of results. And Again, this is the HTML code. Um, it's a div, it's a form, and then we have a, an input file uh, where the user is going to input their search. The only interesting part here is um, this, the action of the form, uh, which is dynamic and it's being um, generated by using the link to uh, function. Um, a link to in this regard is the reverse of routing. The idea is that um, if, for example, we have a, a, an application which has multiple routes and these, uh, well, we, we link to pages within the application, um, we don't want to hard code the URLs to the, to the various section of the application. So we don't want to hard link uh, the URLs which correspond to the routes. The idea being that if the need comes and we need to um, replace this with say something like this, uh, then we're gonna need to, to go and search for all the URLs, uh, which used to be slash movies in all the pages, and that's gonna break, poss possibly gonna break the navigation and it's gonna make um, the pages to be unreachable. Uh, as such, as the, the router is able to convert a URL pattern into a function which is being uh, executed, uh, the link to function um, is able to take some, some input, such as the name of a route, and uh, create the corresponding URL back to, uh, to the route itself. Each route that we created uh, can be given a name, uh, or if no explicit name is being given, um, Gini gives it a name by itself. For example, we can check all the routes that are now defined in the application. And we, will, we, we get the information, we see that they are defined to work over GET. They can also be by POST, DELETE, or other protocols. And we see that, for example, movies, slash movies goes to index, and is being named GET MOVIES automatically by, uh, by the router, or our initial route um, is just called GET because it's the, it's the root, it doesn't have any kind of particle here. Um, okay. Then we also need to create this route that is going to be used by the form. So 
our form here is going to submit to this page, to this route. Going to append it here, and we gave it a name. So, uh, we, yeah, Genie uses um, a naming convention, but if we want to, to control the name ourselves, we just pass it the, the name keyword parameter ourselves. So then we say that any URLs that go to slash movie slash search are going to be resolved by the movies controller search method, and this route is going to be search movies. So now when we say link to search movies, this piece of code will be able to generate this URL over here. <laughs> okay, let's add the search function into the movies controller. And um, we also need to add a few more modules. I don't think we need this. I'm just going to comment it out. Oh, I don't think this is needed. All right, so what we do now, we define the search method uh, where we use search lights find uh, function where we tell it to look for movie entities and we pass uh, a SQL where expression which helps us filter the, um, the data from, uh, from the database. This takes uh, a query-like a query expression. So we, we're just going to search by title, category, description, or, uh, or the actor. So any of them need to match the, the query string. Um, and then we're going to retrieve all the movie results uh, which, which match the query. What this is going to do is going to replace uh, each question mark with uh, one of the values provided as the second parameter. Um, but because we're using the same um, search term in order to match all of them, I'm just basically creating an array which repeats the, um, the same term four times and is, go is going to replace each of the question marks um, with the search term. Um, the idea here is that if we use this approach, we protect ourselves against SQL injection. So if we would be to write the query by hand and we would take the input as it comes from, from the browser, from the client without sanitizing it, then we expose ourselves to SQL injection attacks. Somebody could just send uh, uh, some malicious uh, input, which would break our SQL query and potentially uh, would be able to run random queries against the database. But if we use the SQL word expression, then Searchlight guarantees that the input is going to be uh, sanitized um, and it's going to, to, to create the, um, the search query with the user input uh, automatically. <clears throat> okay. And then, uh, so the first time we used a, a random uh, selection of movie, now we actually find uh, movies which match the search criteria. Mm -hmm. And then again, uh, once we have the result, uh, which we store in the movies uh, variable, we're just going to return it as HTML, uh, and we're going to use the movies index uh, view file again. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see if everything works. Okay. Um, so now we have our input here, and when the user lands uh, without any kind of search, they still get a random, um, a random recommendation, but now we can search for something like comedy. Uh, okay, and we got an error. It says route name search movies is not defined okay so it doesn't know what to do let's see why not search movies probably something is bad fine what devices errors what errors do we have it says search not find Okay, 
So Revise said that movies controller search is not find, but we do have it here. So maybe it cannot be recompiled, or maybe something bad happened. It doesn't seem to be. Let's see. And you're here. Okay, so sometimes um, if Revise tries to uh, reload the application uh, while while it's in a bad state, so for example, we edit a route and point it to a function uh, or to a method in the um, in the controller that is not defined yet. Uh, of course, uh, Revise won't be able to to recompile the app, and that's going to cause it uh, Revise to break. So it, we just have to go over and see what happened and just force you to reload the, um, the file where the problem was encountered, or worst case scenario, uh, exit the REPL and uh, reload the whole application and continue from where we were. Anyway, our search works. So for example, let's see if we take this. Yeah, we get this. Um, I don't know, I've done some searches before. And this is going to return all the matches, matching results. Okay. We did touch upon the params collection. Now we can see it clear. Um, our form submits a get uh, request and it passes the get param search movies with the value of the uh, word that is being uh, queried. And then we can retrieve it here in the params collection with the name uh, search movies and then we can filter our, uh, our data based on that. Are there any questions uh, up to this point? I think we're about done with, uh, with the web app. So we can move on to uh, quickly adding uh, an API endpoint. Hey, one question. Please. It, it, I now also executed from my PC and it took a little bit longer than I expected until the page actually um, loaded the search version. So did you, did you from read the expression or? I reloaded the app a couple of times, but just question um, whether it's uh, sometimes taking half a minute or, or so, or whether it was another issue. No, no, it shouldn't. Um, I mean, probably there was some recompilation or something, but uh, it should be really fast, right? So if you look at this, the query is very fast. Um, yeah, thanks. So maybe you, I haven't saved maybe the file. maybe revised triggered some some recompilation or something, but normally there shouldn't be any kind of issue. And um, yeah, it's just once the Julia code is compiled, uh, it, it should move um, super super fast. So query seems to go quite well, and rendering should be fine. Also, once I mean, if you change, for example, the view that's going to be recompiled so that can cause a delay let's see it picks it up oh uh, yeah but it's still not yeah it wasn't noticeably slower so now basically the whole view was being recreated because you noticed that um, um the the um, the version of the view file is um more recent than what's being creating created and available in the application what happens here, however, um, and something that I noticed, and yeah, it might take a bit of work, I'm not entirely sure how to address it, uh, is that, for example, sometimes it's needed to refresh, or after some changes in the view, um, 
it will be needed to refresh two times in order for revise to pick up the changes. And that's, I think, more because first time, um, first time the page is refreshed, uh, revise is being triggered. Um, so um, the change is being picked by the app. <coughs> and only the second time you refresh, uh, also the browser gets the new, um, the new response from the application. So sometimes if, if you change the view, uh, if you change the template and you notice that there is no change on the front end, um, it might need uh, another refresh just to, to trigger the revise um, compilation. Um, a way to address this is to use the auto reload plugin, which I, I didn't have time to, uh, to go over it today, uh, but it's really very easy to set up. The instructions are on, on the, in, in the repo. And what that does, it's uh, every time you work on the app and you save a file being a, a view template or whatever uh, controller or model, every time it detects uh, that the file has been changed, it automatically forces the browser to, uh, to reload the page that is being displayed and uh, also triggers uh, a revise. So that basically uh, removes the need to refresh the page manually. It just keeps doing it um, automatically by connecting with the page loaded in the browser. Sounds great. Yeah, okay. Makes sense? Okay. All right, then the, um, the last part is to add um, a little API endpoint. Um, there are multiple approaches to, to building APIs and uh, multiple ways of setting up the routing. Um, for example, one way to do it, um, especially if, if you're using uh, a pure, let's say, REST approach where uh, any entity which is exposed on the internet is a resource and any resource is identified by a unique URL, um, the theory would say that <coughs> either with HTML or with JSON or with whatever. <coughs> Sorry, regardless of how we access of and how we request the response, the URL should say the same. So that, that's possible. So we can have the same endpoint um, used to return the response as HTML or as JSON by uh, using um, a different content type for, for the request. And then Gini exposes an API to check the headers and to see what kind of uh, uh, request is being sent. And uh, based on that, we can create a response which, match which matches the same response, uh, the same content type. So for example, if it comes as applica application JSON, we can send back a JSON response. Or if it comes as text HTML, we can send an HTML response. But then we need to, um, to basically look at the headers and um, build our response based on that. Another way to do it um, in regard to versioning, uh, the idea is that once we expose an API that's being on the web, that's being versioned just like any other uh, programming API. So once we have clients which rely on the interface, we cannot change it. That's why APIs are usually versioned. And one way to do this um, is that we can put the versioning in the URL. Uh, but again, the by the book approach would be to use a header which indicates the um, the version of the API that we want to use, so that uh, the URL stays the same. Uh, however, this again would involve working with headers, and I thought that for for the demo it would make it much more involved. That it would be really harder to see the data exchanges. So then I opted to just use <coughs> um, a different type of uh, URL for the uh, for the API. We're just going to expose our API here. We're going to reuse the same logic, the same controllers. Um, we put it in, in uh, slash movie slash search API. Um, and we need to add our search API function. Again, notice that things are not dry, so in production you wouldn't do that. This is duplicated, but just for the sake of keeping it simple, uh, this should be removed, put in, a, put in a separate function, and that function should be called from both these methods, so we don't have duplicated code in, um, on, on our page. Uh, but now just to keep it simpler uh, and to see the process, we're just, we're just doing the same thing um, so here. <clears throat> We're uh, we're looking at the search movies params as it comes on get. 
uh, we create the, um, the query expression, we send it to the database, we take the result and we put it into movies. But the only difference now is that instead of using the HTML renderer, we're just going to use the JSON one and we're going to JSON encode a dictionary, which has as its root the movies string, and then it's just going to take the whole payload of results and uh, render it. Because we're using JSON, we also need to indicate it here that we're going to want it. So I'm hoping this answers the initial question in terms of uh, um, if Genie adds a lot of overhead. Uh, because of its modular approach, um, it can be super light if none of the advanced features are uh, used. Uh, but then it's really handy <clears throat> to just include, include any of the model and just um, basically um, just extend your application with, uh, with any functionality that is available um, if the need arises. So now I have extended the controller to use the JSON renderer. Uh, and now I can use, um, I can output JSON data from, uh, from the application. This should be all. So let's see how it works. I just need to change the URL and keep the same search. And it couldn't find it. Let's see why not. So we put the route, we said movie search API, movies controller search API, movies search API. Um, let's see what broke. Uh, Fail to revise routes, search API not defined. Okay, so again, the same thing issue. Uh, the routes file has not been revised or it has been revised too early when the search API function was not available. Let's include the routes file again. Um, and here it is. It's the same output, but now it comes in uh, JSON form. Uh, okay, that's about it. Um, there was a small section, a bonus one about um, adding um, database backed authentication. So, uh, for example, to add an admin section, uh, I don't know, we have six minutes left. If, if you want, we can go over it. Uh, it's basically, it shows how to use um, a Genie plugin. So we're just going to add the plugin, we're going to install it. Um, it's going to come with its files and we're going to see how uh, so how that's being done. Or uh, you can just look at the repo and you can try doing it yourself and maybe follow up on, on Gitter or in other places if, if you're running into problems. Just, or should we proceed? I think it's valuable to, to sometimes have questions in case there yeah. are questions. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Thank you so much. Uh, can you briefly talk about your experience with like like environments? Uh, only concurrent connection can Genie handle. Um, <clears throat> well, to be honest, um, I don't know about a lot of experiences with high load uh, Julia web applications. Uh, the language is pretty new and is definitely not as uh, widespread as uh, traditional web programming languages. Um, I remember I've been running some um, stress tests at some point um, with, with Genie in production mode. So basically all the um, development optimizations uh, stripped away as it's supposed to run. Uh, no revise, no um, yeah, no file watching and no development um, features. And uh, I'm going to share them. Uh, there was there was a thread, there was an issue on GitHub where we discussed and where we ran all these tests. Basically, the performance was on par with uh, with Ruby on Rails. So that's not um, not not very good in the sense that uh, Julia has a lot of potential to uh, get more performance. Um, but Rails, it's at version six, I think now there's been a lot of effort to to optimize it. And uh, um, yeah, with, with Julia, very little effort has been put into optimizing. 
Um, I think likewise, um, each, each, uh, performance in HTTP JL can be improved. Like I said, Gini runs on top of it, um, but it does add some overhead. So it's pure HTTP JL will be faster. Um, but you know, there's, there's definitely room for improvement in both HTTP JL and Gini. And it's something that is on my uh, my to-do list. And I think if we start putting effort in this direction, uh, we're going to see um, very good results um, relatively quickly. So um, the code at this point is, is pretty much what comes out uh, without any kind of um, focus on optimization. So I'm, I, I am aware myself that a lot of code can be can be optimized. We just didn't get to that. Um, um, yeah, how many concurrent connections? Um, I I will look and I will share it somewhere. I don't know where. I need to find the um, the GitHub issue where we've been running the stress tests, and uh, I will uh, I will link to those. Load balancing. Um, yeah, well, I don't I don't see why there wouldn't, but I mean. Uh, it can be done simply by deploying uh, the Gini app on multiple servers and then using some sort of, I don't know, load balancing scheme. Um, for example, I don't know, round robin or something else. Gini also comes with the caching layer. I, I uh, forgot to mention that, which I like a lot. And it's, uh, I think it, it, it boosts the efficiency a lot. For example, especially if you have uh, functions which are quite expensive and change uh, rarely maybe getting data from a third party API and doing uh, some kind of uh, expensive computations. Uh, it comes with a cache module and uh, pretty much any kind of function can be cached. Um, by default, it will uh, serialize the result um, on the file system, but it also has multiple um, caching backends. So the result of the of the computation, the caching itself can be stored in a, in a Redis backend or in a memcache. And that can also be shared across uh, multiple servers. So for example, if you use a load balancer, um, we, we used it like that. Um, whoever, uh, whatever instance generates the cache first is going to put it in the shared memcache or Redis instance, and then all the load balanced instances are just going to use the cache from uh, from the in-memory database, and uh, that's going to speed things up a lot. Uh, the stress test we did didn't have any caching enabled, so it were just uh, pure JSON part uh, rendering response, something like that. Hey, you just to add, you can you can use the meetup page. Um, there's also for past events the the possibility okay. to add comments. I think this is the most natural place to add such Perfect. further Perfect. links. Perfect. I'll also add uh, the links to the repo and uh, I don't know any other resources. Um, so that yeah, if uh, if somebody gets stuck with the application or they want to um, they want to look on the onto the last part, uh, that would be available. <clears throat> You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I don't know if anything else is, is worth adding. I think we managed to go over most of the things. Um, yeah, from my experience, so what what usually comes up and I didn't have the chance to go over, for example, the router, uh, we didn't look at how to define um, other types of routes, for example, to handle post uh, content or file uploads, but it's also possible. So if you create a form um, uh, that, uh, that knows how to handle file uploads, then Gini on the other side will uh, has the API to save the file on, on, on the hard drive and um, just uh, get the payload from there. Uh, in terms of deployment, uh, there's also an issue that comes up quite often, and um, yeah, we're working on improving the docs, but uh, there are some resources uh, available in the docs, um, either using Docker or using Heroku. Um, also, Gini has a deploy module 
which helps Dockerize a Genie app. Uh, so you, you, you can create the application like we did now, and then we can use Genie Deploy Docker to wrap it into a Docker container, uh, which can then be used to, to deploy on, uh, on, on hosts that support Docker. Um, and I don't know, I think, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, and these, these are the issues that come up most, uh, most oftenly. So the question is, uh, if I had some experience on serving machine learning models with Genie or HTTP for high availability, for example, bulk of sentiment labeling. Um, I'm not sure what what would this entail. Would be the would the model be trained already, or um, or is it that the URL is being accessed and the model is being trained? while the request is being processed or um, I think it I, I'm, I'm not sure where the bottleneck would be um, well I've, I've, I've well I've done some applications um, more for steeple um, some of the demos for example um, um, go over a recommender application but it's really uh, the issue there is not as much as uh, is, is not as much about the the web app, which pretty much displays uh, whatever Julia produces. Um, so the performance there or the bottleneck there will be um, whatever the machine learning model uh, computes or outputs and the performance of the model itself. You can imagine that, for example. Um, you're having a machine learning model instead of a database model in this regard. So instead of using a searchlight uh, model to retrieve data from a database, you'd have uh, another module um, which would expose a machine learning model, which would uh, yeah return whatever uh, recommendation or whatever um, data uh, it I don't know it produces. So the 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 web front end would would not have any kind of uh, relation or would wouldn't wouldn't add any kind of complication or delay. It would only come from from the model. You you basically swap the database model with the machine learning model. Um, the the really nice part about Genie is that uh, it's purely Julia code, so it doesn't do anything. Um, out of the ordinary, a, a Genie app is just a, a regular Julia app. It uses a um, package to, to manage dependencies. It uses, uh, um, I don't know, the manifest file. It, it loads modules which are on the file system or it uses other dependencies uh, which are being installed um, in, in, the, in the application scope. So, if, if you can run the machine learning model or you can or if you can basically uh, produce a Julia script uh, that runs on the computer, then it's really uh, just an issue of adding um, a simple um, genie shell, let's say, uh, to expose the data produced by your uh, by your Julia code uh, and render it on the web using the HTML or JSON renderer or something else. Does that help the question or answer the question? Thanks for the question. Okay, great. I think then it's time to kind of finish the presentation part. I would like to thank you very much, Adrian, for preparing this, yeah, go. To go through. Oh, so someone asked for the bonus. Yeah, we will have time. And if Adrian has more time to stay, we can go into the bonus afterwards. But as the official two first hours kind of are now over, where yeah, the meetup was scheduled for just for, for everyone to have kind of a nice uh, cut here. Thank you very much, Adrian, for preparing this material and showing it to us. I did everything and it worked all for me. So awesome experience. Thank yeah. you for the invitation and um, yeah, I mean, um, 
first time that I'm doing uh, live uh, coding, so uh, <laughs> I'm sorry if uh, it wasn't as uh, smooth and uh, flowy as I would have liked, but I'm, I'm hoping that um, it's been clear and uh, I managed to um, to show the the more important points. And there are well, if there are any questions, just please follow up on on Gitter or on the Meetup uh, comment section. Or uh, you know, just find me on on some of the other uh, platforms, and happy to to talk about it. Um, I can stay for ten more minutes if, uh, if if anybody wants to see the bonus. Uh, it, it shouldn't take long. Um, I'm I'm happy to. It should be quite quick, and I think it's interesting to see um, a bit of the plugins uh, ecosystem. But uh, I don't know. Up to you guys. So there was already interest from Eduardos. Um, I am also curious, so we can look into the plugin system. All right, <laughs> cool. So yeah, then uh, with the plugin system, um, the idea was that um, many of the features were being added into the core, uh, which became more uh, more complex, larger, harder to manage. Uh, this is more of an issue, for example, when adding uh, Genie or when updating and when pre-compiling. Um, so then it made sense to, to separate some of the functionalities which would not be part of the, of the core uh, into plugins. And that's especially true, for example, with, uh, with an authentication plugin, which uses both Genie and Searchlight. So basically it also needs a database backend, so it relies on, uh, on multiple packages. Uh, Genie comes with a, with, a, with a plugins API, which makes it really easy uh, to create uh, plugins for Genie. So it, it's got generator for, um, for plugins, which are just regular Julia packages and have Genie as a dependency. Uh, and also it poses an API to work with plugins. Thank you for, uh, for coming, bye bye, for, for watching. Uh, and um, yeah, it was an API that makes it um, easy to work with the plugins, install them and use them in the application. So one of the questions that comes up quite often is how to create uh, an admin or um, some sort of um, authentication protected uh, area of a website. And uh, there's, a, there's an authentication plugin for that. Uh, because a, a Genie plugin is just a regular Julia package, uh, we need to start by installing it. So we're going to go and edit. I'm running Julia 1.6, so now it does pre-compilation upon editing the package. <laughs> so I pre-compile Gene Authentication and I pre-compile the application. And now that we have it, we can use the plugin. We're going to bring it into scope. And as I was saying, we can use the install method, this API, to set up the plugin into the directory of the application. Each plugin would come with a custom uh, install routine. So, for example, in this case, in your authentication, uh, just like we've seen before, uh, with uh, generating a new resource, Genio authentication would also generate its own resources. So, it's going to have um, all the just seed. Okay. Um, so the plugin itself creates a series of resources which are placed on the, the authentication folder. Uh, it creates a controller, it controls its own views, so it provides views for logging in, for registering. Um, it's going to create a model for managing the users, it's going to create the user validator because there are certain requirements for a valid user like an email, a username, a password and so on. It's going to generate the database migration, which will be uh, which we can use and need to use to generate the, um, the corresponding database table, and then it adds in a plugins folder a file which is called Genio Authentication, um, and these are similar to initializers. So uh, both the files in initializers and the files in plugins um, are being loaded very early in the application's lifetime. So once we start an application, one of the first things it does. It loads the initializers and uh, whatever it finds in plugins uh, in order to make this functionality available later in the um, in the controllers, in the in the modules, in the model in the models, and wherever it's needed. 
So in the sense, whatever it's in plugins, it's similar to um, to initializer, just that they're loaded right after the initializers. Okay. And then what this did, so we can see that it created a new resource with an authentication controller. We normally don't need to touch it. Uh, that's the idea of using the plugin. It created a series of views, one for logging in and one for registering. Um, I don't know what else. Um, the Gene Authentication plugin where it defines a series of routes and uh, the, dependency, the dependencies that it needs. And um, the migration, which is this. <clears throat> we already seen the process of running a migration, so we, we should understand now uh, how it works. Um, we can see that, um, oops, what happens here? We can see that uh, Searchlight, for example, is aware that um, a new migration has appeared and it's going to tell us that it's down. So the, the previous one is up, we executed it, um, and this create table users is, is not yet run. We need to run it, so we're just going to pass. Another way to run a specific migration is to just pass the name of it. This is the name here. So we just pass it here in, as a parameter to the app method. And this executed the migration, so basically it created um, the users table. This was the migration. It created a table called users, a primary key, and columns for username, password name, email, and it added the uh, index on the username column. Father down uh, method, which is delete, delete uh, the table. <clears throat> okay. Um, we have now all the functionality that we need in order to authenticate the users, um, but we need to create something where that we can protect with a uh, with a password. So let's create a fictional um, admin uh, controller. Notice here that I'm passing an additional option, which is pluralize false. Um, by convention, um, controllers are pluralized. So for example, if I want to create a resource called movie, the controller would be called uh, movies controller because it, it's used to manage multiple movies. Same goes for the module, which contains the controller, for example, it's called movies, while the mo model itself, sorry, for the module which, which includes the model, while the model itself is singular. So the model is movie, the module is movies, and so on. But here in the in the admin, it didn't make any sense to call it admins controller. So we're just gonna say to not pluralize it. And this is gonna create our new controller uh, inside resources admin, admin controller. Let's see where it is. It's here, admin controller. Again, it's just an empty Julia model where we need to put our code. <clears throat> Um, when we installed the uh, plugin, it created um, the initializer, the plugin's genuine authentication file, which is automatically loaded when the app is started. But now, because we added the plugin when the app is already running, we'll need to uh, load it by hand. So we're just going to do it and include it. Mm. This precompiles the authentication controller module or package. A bit okay, so it executed um, <coughs> the plugin file, it added the routes, <coughs> and now we're able to log in. Uh, there are two routes for logging in one is on get to show the login form, and one is on post, it's when the login form submits in order to perform the actual login, so to look in the database for the username and the password, and then we also have a login route. <coughs> I think we can already see it, um, <clears throat> but we need to add the route. For example, we can, we're adding the route to the uh, protected um, fictional admin area. We're saying that we're going to have admin slash movies, which is going to point to the admin controller index method, um, and it's going to be called get home. <clears throat> Because we're referencing admin controller, we also need to put it here. So we're going to say this. <clears throat> and we need to add the code 
in the controller itself. <coughs> um, here. In controller. Okay. Then what this does, it's um, it uses Gene authentication and it uses some of the other um, uh, Gini modules, and it invokes a before hook. Um, before hook is, is a special kind of um, method, let's say. So when um, the code on, for a request is being executed by Gini, it's going to look for these special hooks. So if the controller, if if, if the handler defines a before method, that is going to be executed before uh, the actual handler of the request. So in this sense, if we have a route, this one, which will try to execute, I mean, controller index, um, before it actually is going to execute this piece of code. So it's going to try to, it's going to check if, if any user is being authenticated with the request, and if not, it's going to throw an exceptional response, um, which takes a payload, and it basically uh, will redirect the browser to the show login um, route. Uh, show login route being um, registered by the um, authentication plugin. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me see. There are some questions. Fra uh, Frank, thank you. Yes, for sure. Let's uh, let's talk about search searchlight. Um, as we discussed. Um, yes, um, thank you for the feedback about the book. Um, yeah, it, it would be nice to come with the second version and I discussed with uh, with the guys at Pocket. Um, things have been moving so fast in, in the Julia ecosystem that uh, um, even the code in the book works. Uh, many ways of doing things have changed between 2018 and 2021 in the last three years. So, um, yeah, I also think uh, a second version would be nice. And they said uh, they're definitely happy to do one, but um, uh, more likely when when uh, Julia version two will uh, will be out. So hopefully that will happen soon. Uh, <clears throat> is it easy to restrict users to certain pages? Um, so now, um, basically, the restriction applies to um, a whole section. So it's being applied at the controller level or at module level. Um, <clears throat> but I think we could extend it so that it would apply in a sense to uh, to function level. Maybe we, we could couple it with routes, or maybe we can think of some sort of wrapper. But now the idea is that a whole um, controller, a whole module will be protected. Uh, for example, like an admin section or something like that, which is going to, which is going to include the whole uh, admin protected area. Uh, there's another issue here. Uh, so there's authentication, but there's also authorization, which is different. Um, and at some point I worked on that, but it's kind of a tricky issue, so um, I wasn't happy with the result and I scrapped it. But it would also, if, if you go into complex aspects, you also need to assign different roles to users. So in this sense, uh, probably another uh, Gini of, uh, authorization plugin would be more useful to say, which user can access which functions uh, depending on uh, what roles they have uh, in the system. <clears throat> um, okay, so I think this should work now. We have the route, uh, we have the controller. Uh, if the login is successful, you're welcome. If the, lo if the authentication is, su is successful, we should see a welcome admin uh, message. Otherwise, we should be sent back to the to the login page. <clears throat> so let's see if it works, and hopefully, I'm not logged in. Uh, the authentication is being stored on uh, on a session cookie. So let's see how uh, if I have any from my tests. Let me go to admin movies. Let's see. All right, so it just the application created the sessions folder, and um, 
Yeah, I didn't find any session because the application is new, so we didn't have any kind of, of session stored for my user on file. So then, um, yeah, the, the plugin basically redirected me to, uh, to the login page. If I try to put stuff in here, it's not going to work. Uh, just going to say the authentication failure is just going to keep sending us back. You can see in the back end how, um, how the plugin queries the database. Um, the password is automatically being hashed, so no passwords are being stored in clear in the database. Um, and obviously the reason why we can't log, log in is that we haven't really created any kind of uh, admin user. Uh, we can look at this, for example, if we search um, using users, if you say all, all user, there's not going to be any. We don't have any kind of users in the in the users table. A question. <clears throat> um, where do query objects, session cookie leave? How are they passed into before authenticated? Can authenticate also be called in index? Um, so let's see. Admin controller. <clears throat> The authenticated method is being exposed by the Gini authentication uh, module, if I remember correctly, but I'm not entirely sure. Is authenticated session? Let's see where it goes. Yeah, so it's part of the Gini authentication package, and it, it automatically uses uh, <clears throat> the, the session system um, made available by Gini. As I was saying, this is a, a, the good part about convention over configuration. Uh, we know that there's a uh, sessions and the cookie module, and that's available to uh, all the packages that are using Genie as a dependency. Um, when um, when the session are when the session support is loaded, let's say, or when the the module is loaded into the scope, um, the the session headers are being automatically being uh, appended to the requests and that everything is being done transparently uh, by Gini in the background. If we look, for example, now we should see a sessions folder. Here it is. Uh, and this is the session that it has created for uh, for my user. Uh, this should be encrypted. It's also a binary file, so it cannot be displayed, but also it's encrypted. Uh, all the encryption in, in Genie is done using um, a unique secrets file, which is here. Every time a new Genie application is created, a new secret token a random is being uh, created, especially for that application. So then each Genie application has a unique encryption uh, key, uh, and all the sensitive data uh, is being encrypted with this uh, with this specific uh, key. Um, I think it can be called. I don't know. We can try it. I don't know if it's going to work, but let's see. Uh, the pattern is to to use it as a before, but I don't know. Let's see what happens. Um, it seems also that this authenticated method just has two methods, two functions defined, and none with zero arguments. Um, oh, do, 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 do. Let's see. Da, da. Mm. Yeah, I don't know what this one finds, because authenticated, I don't know why it points to is authenticated. Ah, because authenticated is a constant here. Is authenticated to um, the session is set session. Dun, dun. I think it goes into this one where it takes params. So uh, because this is the only one which has a default uh, is, is a default param. So this one would match this one is authenticated, uh, and here basically. Uh, the function just goes and retrieves itself the the request payload, so all the information that comes with the uh, with the payload, and then it looks into the session object uh, to see if the user is authenticated based on the session data. Make sense? Yeah. Thanks. 
Okay. Uh, I don't know. Let's see if this works. Uh, it might. I don't know. I don't. I don't see why not. So let's try something. Oh no, let's try to go straight to it, right? So index is being served by admin movies. Okay, it's recompiling. No matter mentioned before. Okay, but well why? Have we left any before? Okay, let's see what's from here. So I think it's still looking for before. Yeah, it may be that that's why it doesn't work because it's it wants something to be before. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure. We can uh, we can look into it, but it seems to be upset of, of, of the fact that there's no before hook being defined. Um, um, maybe if you uh, uncomment it and let it uh, run successfully through every time, then it's redefined the before function. Yeah. Uh, authenticated or, but I don't think this, this needs to return something, but I don't remember what. So it's either authenticated or true. Let's see if this works. Mm. It seems to have worked. Yeah. Uh, let's try again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this seems to work. So it, it basically keeps redirecting back to uh, to the login page. So. I guess this, in a way, can solve the problem of adding your authentication to a certain function and not to the whole module. But let's see, if, for example, we do this. It would not be authenticated, and it should allow us to access it. So if we say, oops. Okay, it should work. Again. Let's ask for out. Foo not defined. Yeah, okay, same problem. Include. So it works, actually. Um, yeah, awesome. So then, yeah, it doesn't need to be applied uh, at module level. It can it can be applied at individual function scope, and then we can protect uh, functions. Let's see if it really works by setting up a login. Uh, movies. Okay. So let's create an admin user. Let's go back to the repo and do it. We're just going to use search like for that. Mm. What I'm doing is I'm creating an instance of a user. I'm, I'm passing um, the email, the name, all the all the keyword properties, the password for the password. Um, because this doesn't go through the model, I'm just uh, telling it to hash the password um, upon um, upon creating it now, so to store it hashed. Uh, hashed. Okay. And now I'm going to persist it. So now we should have um, an admin user. Okay. And now if we try to log in, 
with it. And see it was admin and admin. What we said. So the password is admin and the username was admin. Let's see if this works. All right, and it worked. Now welcome admin. So it basically allowed us to access the content of this. Okay. All right, uh, that was it <laughs> this time, also with a bonus. Any questions? Thank you for uh, for for watching. Thank you for your interest. Uh, thank you for uh, for the really good questions. Um, let me know if there's anything. Pretty great. Thanks, Thanks so much, again, Adrian. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure. I I really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm uh, I'm gonna follow up in regards to the stress tests and uh, like I said if there's any other questions or uh, you know if you want to get in touch um, you're gonna easily find me on all the um, all the channels and happy to chat about it and discuss it about it at, in more detail thanks so much again for the invitation Okay, so then we approach open end. So if someone wants to stay longer, please feel welcome to use this opportunity to just code a little bit on whatever you want. I always think it's valuable to have such a space. And yeah, but anyway, some are left. I wish everyone a, a lovely evening. Okay. And actually, yes, it's um, Adrian. I mean, it's only a few left, but can we already tell that in two months? We may look into Stipple. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would love to if uh, if you enjoyed the, this one and if you found it interesting. Um, Stipple is a different kind of beast. Uh, it's really more, uh, I mean, Jimmy is focused and is geared towards uh, web developers, um, but Stipple is it's it's more towards researchers and and scientists and data scientists. So. It's a it's a really high level tool for um, for building uh, data visualization applications, um, interactive data dashboards, and um, we uh, basically the the package the library itself the, um, it's it's functional. It, it does plotting. It does UI elements. It does um, now it has LaTeX support. Um, and we're working on a um, visual application builder, which will allow to create um, this kind of uh, reactive Julia web applications by dragging and dropping elements into, into place. Um, let me show you a bit. This is the, the page of the project. Um, this is the working project, but the work in progress, but um, this is how it's going to look. It's also going to, to provide a very easy way to deploy this application on the cloud. Um, and then we'd like to, to add additional features. For now, the project is open sourced here in its current state. There are a series of demos. Um, I, uh, I showed off people a bit at JuliaCon uh, last year in 2020. So there are some demos. Um, it can already be used to create uh, this kind of highly interactive uh, data dashboards and uh, they can be tried out. Uh, meanwhile, I've, uh, I've also added um, support for plotly charts. So um, the, um, basically the charting uh, support has been uh, enhanced compared to, to the initial version. Uh, the UI is quite rich and we can develop all sorts of, of um, highly reactive applications with all sorts of UI elements and everything just updates in real time. Uh, the kind of single page um, single page applications that are being built with uh, with a lot of JavaScript, but with Steeple, there's basically no need for, uh, for JavaScript coding. Everything is just pure Julia code, um, which was like this in a sense. 
would be awesome to have a hands-on session in Stable as well. Yeah. It would be my pleasure, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Well, in this case, uh, if there aren't any more uh, questions, I'm uh, I'm gonna log off, and um, yeah, um, we can just follow up on um, on the meetup uh, comments and uh, all the other channels. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for your time. Have a good night. Have a good day. You too. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. See you. Bye.